Our scripture reading for this afternoon will be from Acts 7, verses 44 through 60. Verse 44. Our fathers had the tent of witness in the wilderness, just as he who spoke to Moses directed him to make it according to the patterns that he had seen. Our fathers, in turn, brought it in with Joshua when they dispossessed the nations that God drove out before our fathers. So it was until the days of David, who found favor in the sight of God and asked to find a dwelling place for the God of Jacob. But it was Solomon who built a house for him. Yet the Most High does not dwell in houses made by hands, as the prophet says, Heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. What kind of house will you build for me, says the Lord, or what is the place of my rest? Did you not hand, did not my hand make all these things? You stiff-necked people, uncircumcised in hearts and ears, you always resist the Holy Spirit. As your fathers did, so do you. Which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? And they killed those who announced beforehand the coming of the righteous one, whom you have now betrayed and murdered. You who received the law as delivered by the angels and did not keep it. Now, when they heard these things, they were enraged and they ground their teeth at him. But he, full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God. And Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And then he said, Behold, I see the heavens opened, and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. But they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and rushed together at him. Then they cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their garments at the feet of a young man named Saul. And as they were stoning Stephen, he called out, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And falling to his knees, he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. The text for this afternoon's sermon comes from God's word, summarized in Lord's Day 19. So I'll read that for you now. Question 50. Why is it added and sits at the right hand of God? Answer, Christ ascended into heaven to manifest himself there as head of his church, through whom the Father governs all things. 51, how does the glory of Christ, our head, benefit us? Answer, first, by his Holy Spirit, he pours out heavenly gifts upon us, his members. Second, by his power, he defends and preserves us against all enemies. Question 52. What comfort is it to you that Christ will come to judge the living and the dead? Answer. In all my sorrow and persecution, I lift up my head and eagerly await as judge from heaven the very same person who before has submitted himself to the judgment of God for my sake and has removed all the curse from me. He will cast all his and my enemies into everlasting condemnation. But he will take me and all his chosen ones to himself into heavenly joy and glory. We live in a time when we look around the world, there seems to be increasingly more and more problems. There's war, political corruption, and Christian persecution. These are realities many of us are aware of. Last year, over 5,500 Christians were murdered. Over uh, over 2,000 churches were attacked. And over 4,500 Christians were detained because of their faith. Now, hearing news like this is troubling. It is not pleasant to think of the evil that is going on in the world or in the country or in our community. There are forces that would like nothing more than to see the church destroyed. And these topics, these topics, they're serious and they should be treated as such. 
But as serious as these issues are, we know one thing. These forces will never ultimately be victorious in their mission. And the only way to truly know that, the only way to have confidence in this ultimate triumph of the church or of Christianity, despite hardship or persecution or death, this confidence is only found and only given through our Lord Jesus Christ. Turning our attention to Acts 7 and Lord's Day 19 this afternoon, we have this wonderful opportunity to be strengthened in our faith by understanding the position of Jesus at the right hand of the Father and the fact that Jesus will return once more to judge the living and the dead. Just as the ascension of Christ, as discussed by Pastor Slaw last week in Lord's Day 18, is not merely a statement of fact, but has tangible consequences, the position of Jesus at the right hand of God, too, has a wonderful impact on each and every one of us. So this afternoon, we will consider Lord's Day 19 under the following theme and points. The ascended King Jesus bestows great blessings upon his church. One, by his glorious position, and two, by his comforting judgment. So, in the Apostles' Creed, we have this line that is speaking about Jesus, and it says this, and sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. Okay, so what does it mean for Jesus to be at the right hand of God, to govern all things? Let's start general and our work our way and get specific. So, in ancient kingdoms, um, this kind of idea of being at the right hand was common. A king often placed authority on those close to him to do his will. And with this idea of authority, there's also this idea of action. Think of Joseph, for example, in Genesis 41. The Pharaoh gives Joseph this authority over the land and people of Egypt. His authority is not just one of status, but Joseph really does lead. He acts and he works in the nation he has been made charge of. So specifically, when we say that Jesus is at the right hand of God, we're also expressing Jesus as highly exalted, as the one who reigns in glory and in power and in authority. In Ephesians 1, 20 to 23, it says this, that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly places far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him as a head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. In the resurrection and ascension of Jesus, we see the truthfulness of everything Jesus said about himself as the Son of God. Now, as Paul writes in his letter to the Ephesians, Jesus is in the position of ultimate honor at the right hand of God, from where his authority is extended over all beings. As the head of the church, Jesus rules over it. Just as Joseph's authority was more than a mere status symbol, Jesus' position as head of the church is active. All things in the whole entire universe, physical, spiritual, angelic, demonic, they are all under his feet. Simply put, what does it mean to be the head of the church? To be at the right hand of God? It means to have the highest possible honor and authority. Okay, so Jesus is at this place of honor and authority. What does he do exactly? What does it mean that Jesus, by his Holy Spirit, pours out heavenly gifts upon his members? By Jesus' word and by the Holy Spirit, Jesus blesses us by gathering, interceding, and preserving the church. God gathers his people to himself by the preaching and teaching of his word. God's word is given to us under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, and it is true it is not like any other writing. Through the Holy Spirit's work, people come to know God. They come to know Jesus, 
the heavenly gift of faith is poured out onto, pe- onto the people who believe in Jesus Christ. Listen to the words of John 1, 10 through 13, which tells us, He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Not by the will of man, not by his own flesh, but of God. See, the word of God is not neutral. In Acts 7, as Stephen preached, the people hearing increased in anger. Acts 7.54 says, Now when they heard these things, they were enraged, and they ground their teeth at him. See, the, world, uh, the word of God either exposes the callousness of man, it shows our sin, it reveals our true nature, or it penetrates us to the heart. Jesus, at the right hand of the Father, continually intercedes for those in the church. We are sinners by nature. And as sinners, we are considered rebels to God. Even though we are sinners, we have an advocate who cares for us and loves us. Jesus, who by his death on the cross, won for us all salvation. 1 John 2, 1-2 says, My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. He is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but for the sins of the whole world. God continually works throughout all human history for good. When we look in Acts 7 and we read through Stephen's sermon to the Jews in Jerusalem, the general theme throughout the entire chapter is this idea of how God has led Israel. Look how God has work, worked. Look how he has spoke and sustained his people. Even though people grumbled against Moses or the prophets and were unfaithful to God, the faithfulness of the Lord remained. Only by Jesus as the head of the church, the eternal word who shares an equal glory and authority and honor with the Father and the Holy Spirit, Jesus who with the Father sends the Holy Spirit so that he will bestow bestow upon us a true knowledge of God, a true faith, This is a part of the blessing that can only come from God. A true faith that wholeheartedly trusts in Jesus Christ, who blesses us with grace upon grace, as it says in John 1.16. Jesus as our head also blesses us by preserving his church. In Matthew 16, 18, Jesus says to Peter in the second part of the verse, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Jesus' life, death, resurrection, ascension, all testify that this is the truth. The killing of Stephen did not stop the church because even death is subject to God. Jesus has conquered death. And since he is the one who is in charge, and since he is the one who sustains us, our preservation is guaranteed. Even in times and places of terrible persecution, the light of the church never ceased to shine. And often, the church would expand because of it, or through persecution. In 2023, uh, a big Christian organization, they did a lot of stats, accumulating information. They made this top 10 list, these top 10 countries that were the worst countries to be in if you were a Christian. And they looked at things like leadership, policies, extremism that existed in the area, and other things. And they came out with this list. And the country with the highest level of persecution, according to them, was North Korea. This is a country that it's illegal, illegal to own a Bible. You cannot be expressing your faith. You cannot profess faith in Christ there outwardly. Yet, despite the killing or imprisonment, the church still exists in North Korea. In that country of around 25 million people, they estimate upwards of 400,000 people are Christians. 
there is an underground church that meets and worships. A friend of mine actually got to spend time in one of these types of countries for a few months. And while they were there, they were under these orders not to do or say anything perceived as evangelism. They were not to mention Jesus while interacting with any of the citizens. Well, it didn't take too long for something to happen. And while in a room with several of these citizens and a chaperone designated to specifically watch my friend, a person in the room sneezed. And my friend, without even thinking, just blurted out, oh, bless you. Now, some people raised their heads. There were obviously some people that were confused, but actually nobody said anything. And after some time had passed, the activity they were doing in this room came to a close and they were instructed all to leave. And this older woman, she approached my friend as she was leaving and she quickly and quietly whispered to my friend, Jesus Christ, bless you. Whether it is Satan or demons, North Korea, Iraq, or Canada, Jesus is on the throne at the right hand of the Father, preserving his church. As it says in Psalm 63, verse 8, my soul clings to you, your right hand upholds me. Oh, how every day and every hour and every minute and every second do we need Jesus, the only one who loves us, the only one who preserves us and continually intercedes for us, who blesses us with faith and love and perseverance and every good thing. Point two, by his comforting judgment. This second point may seem somewhat counterintuitive. How can judgment be comforting? And I think that is a fair question, after all. When Christians, and particularly the Western Christians, are broadly polled on the existence of hell, the large majority of church, church-going people agree. Absolutely, there is a hell. But if you poll these exact same church-going Christians and you ask them this question, and Organizations like Leonier Ministries have done exactly that. You get them into a room and you poll them on this question and you ask them if you agree or disagree. The question is, do my small sins warrant hell? Do my small sins warrant hell? Agree or disagree? Well, believe it or not, um, A large percent, 64% of church-going Christians responded, no, I do not believe my smaller sins would warrant for myself hell. And in 2022, an even larger group of Christians answered, saying, no, my smaller sins do not warrant me hell. And it, it increased to 69%. Now, this is a troubling statistic. And ultimately, it stems from not understanding sin and God's judgment. God hates sin. He abhors it. In Psalm 5.5, it is written, The boastful shall not stand before your eyes. You hate all evildoers. What we might think of as small sins, God finds absolutely detestable. See, God is completely holy. He is without sin. A God who is perfectly holy, who is perfectly just, cannot turn a blind eye I towards sin. 1 John 1 5 puts it this way This is the message we have heard from him and proclaim to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. So, why, someone might ask, why would a God send someone to this place of everlasting torment for a few small sins? Well, First, we all commit way more than uh, just a few, but let's pretend it's just one sin. God would still have to judge you, and you would be judged rightly as a sinner deemed worthy for hell. I think we all intuitively understand that the consequences should fit the wrong that was committed. So we might ask, well, that doesn't seem to fit. One finite sin warrants eternity under the judgment of God? Really? The answer is yes, because we have to understand the punishment isn't primarily about what you have done, but who you have done it to. 
let's maybe take an example to illustrate this point. If I have a knife and I, I grab a rock and I scratch the rock with this knife, uh, some of you might look at me kind of weird, but no one will really bat an eye. If I go into a used car lot and do the same action, run a knife across one of their used cars, my punishment's going to increase. If I go to a new car lot, it's a new Ford truck or something like that, and I use a knife and I scratch the side of that, my punishment only increases. And if I were to go to a shop that had Lamborghinis and I did the exact same thing, my punishment and my charges would be even more steep. See, our punishment relates not to just what we have done, but it relates to the value of the object we have sinned against. God is of infinite glory and honor, and he is exalted above every name. To sin against God, even just one sin, is worthy of eternal punishment because the transgre- transgression, transgression is done to an eternal God. The truth of the matter is that all sin deserves hell. And contrary to what many Christians in the broader Western church might think, Jesus is a part of this judgment. We profess that Jesus is coming again to judge the living and the dead. As it is written in Acts 17 and 31, it says, because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man who, whom he has appointed, And of this, he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. And this is good news. Jesus is perfect. He makes no mistakes. And that means Jesus' judgment is also perfect. As Christians who are being transformed and more and more being conformed to Jesus, we should desire that God righteously judges man. Romans 12, 19 says, Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. A true trust in this, in the fact that God judges, actually grants us all comfort. Because we understand we do not have to be our own personal judge or jury and executioner who has to look at every personal wrong committed against us and say, well, I need to make this right. I need to defend my honor. Otherwise, who else will? Well, as Romans 12 continues, it it answers this objection, and it says, on the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. For by doing, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil but overcome evil with good. Let's turn our attention to Stephen in Acts 7. After his sermon, his listeners rise up against him. Stephen is then faced with the highest form of persecution, death. And yet, even in the face of death, Stephen is supernaturally calm. In the account, Stephen is granted this vision of the heavens opening up, and he sees the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. Stephen's audience is put into a frenzy, and the chapter ends like this, verses 59 and 60. And as they were stoning Stephen, he called out, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And falling to his knees, he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. Stephen calls out, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And this is a witness of his confidence as a Christian, despite the hardship he is facing. And this is a prayer modeled after Jesus' own words. As Jesus was crucified in Luke 23, 46, Jesus says, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Then as Stephen is being stoned, Uh, as being stoned, he does not hurl insults, but prays for their forgiveness. Again, like Jesus, who prayed for his enemies on the cross, Stephen exemplifies this Christ-centered, God-given grace in the presence of death, this confident trust of Jesus who is at the right hand of the Father. Then the chapter ends. It says that Stephen fell asleep. 
This death is described at the very end as a, in a sense of being very peaceful. Stephen can have this peace because his assurance ultimately was not with himself. Stephen dies at peace with God, with himself, and even with his enemies. Stephen has this peace, and we can have this peace with our surroundings by knowing that it is Jesus who is at the right hand of the Father. As Christians, we are given God's word to confirm our faith. When we come to know Jesus, who sits at the right hand of the Father, what we really learn is this, a profound sense of peace, a peace like nothing else we have experienced. A confident trust in Jesus pardons us from the wrath that was due upon us and leaves us with peace. Romans 5.1 says, Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. If Jesus is on his throne, and he is, then we have peace with God. When we, are at, when we spiritually are at peace, we also can have peace with our neighbor as well. See, when we know that we are forgiven, we are more likely to want to forgive others for the wrongs they committed towards us. If Jesus is on his throne, and he is, then we have peace with the future. Sometimes we might say something like this, uh, you know, look at the world, it's, it's getting worse and worse every day. And maybe in ways that there, there, there really is some truth behind that. There is persecution that exists uh, today. There are evil forces at work. We should be able to both acknowledge this evil and call it out. But ultimately, when we are in the presence of evil, or we hear about evil that is happening in the world around us, let us remember the kingship of Christ. Stephen faced tremendous evil, and even though he did not live to see it on earth, his prayers were answered. Saul, who watched and approved the stoning, uh, approved the stoning of Stephen, ultimately experienced the risen Savior and was forgiven. God answered Stephen's prayer. In closing, listen to the words of Colossians. 1, 20, verse through 22, which says, And through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. And you, who once were alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he has now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death, in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. If Jesus is on his throne, and he is, then we can have peace with ourselves. Jesus says in Matthew eleven twenty eight, Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Often, many of us walk around with some of these types of burdens. We carry a lot on us and a lot on our shoulders, and we just don't have to. We carry our, our, our shame over past sins or ongoing sins. We carry grudges and bitterness and anger and resentment and we have fears and anxieties. And we just take all this time and all these moments looking at ourselves or we're looking down on others or angry at others when we can raise our heads and look to the God above, seated in all honor and glory and power, a God who loves us. By turning our head to our Lord Jesus, we can have peace. Amen.